We should finish the year on a big note. Oh, I, I'm on record as saying 5,000 in the S&P is a possibility, which is 15% up from here. You're, you're, you're very bullish on, I, on the market, right? Because last time we spoke, you've had a, a change of heart here. I did. In mid-January, we had a momentum breakout in terms of advancing stocks versus declining stocks. And historically, that's been a signal that the bear market is over. So we've been bullish since mid-January with a particular focus on tech stocks. Now, let's talk tech stocks because often I hear, but Mark, they're too expensive. People are wary of entering this sector, but you say not, not so? Not so at all. And what we're looking at, is not just the mega cap stocks like Amazon and yeah. Google and, uh, you know, the stocks that really led the bull market in 2021, we're looking at software and semiconductors. And from NVIDIA to Adobe to AMD, there's so many opportunities here, especially as the market starts to pull back from recent highs. Yeah, you, you were telling me offline, you really, you mentioned semiconductors, you really like the semiconductors, you think they're, they're cheap here. I am, and what the difference is AI. So semiconductors are cyclical, as you know, and so they go up and down with the economy typically, but this AI revolution, and I really believe in it, is a game changer for semiconductors. Okay, this is fascinating to me because, again, there's fear of AI, of how it will change our world, but are, could it be the savior of the stock market? I think so. In the same way that the Internet was a productivity tool that started in the mid-90s and drove a huge bull market, and to this day, obviously the Internet is a great productivity game changer. Same way AI, I'm not as concerned about the loss of jobs. I think there's going to be a pickup in jobs yes. for people who are very conversant in AI. I was actually at a fascinating conference last week that uh, Joel Littman, our, our colleague at Stansbury, invited me to, Ernst & Young, hosted it. And they were saying one of the biggest misconceptions in mainstream media is to, is to believe that there will be a, a loss of jobs or a, there's not going to be a need for humans working um, you know, due to AI. Do you really believe that? I, I, I don't. I no, don't. I no. don't either. Yeah. I mean, you know, going back as far as the buggy whip, you know, when the automobile came on board, a lot of people lost their jobs who made buggy whips and other things associated right. with non-automobile transportation. So Innovation is unbelievable, and we've just got to buy into it. So let's separate the power gauge from shake and money flow, which is one of the 20 factors in okay. the power gauge rating. It's a quant rating and it's fundamental. Shake and money flow tells you what the big money is doing. So as an example, the power gauge turned bullish on NVIDIA back in November. Imagine. And AMD and Fortinet, all these tech related stocks that people were shying away from because they had been in some serious bear markets. So the 20 factor model turned bullish. And smart money has just continued to buy since November. That's the ideal combination. It's combustible. It, it can light up a stock going forward. Can you, is there another example you can name? So you named NVIDIA? Well, I'm going to go away from tech because it's not just tech. Generac, one of our okay. recent recommendations, symbol is uh, GNRC. They make backup power supplies. Power gauge turned bullish about a month and a half ago. This is a stock that's down from 520 to 130. Think about that. Wow. It, was a, it was a darling of the stay-at-home people with all the severe weather we're having in America. We've had a lot of blackouts. This is a company with a great long-term future. Everybody's looking at Tesla as a power play, right? It's the, it's the electric batteries that really is the juice behind, well, no pun intended, behind Tesla. Same thing with Generac. If you own a home, and you're in an area that's had extreme weather, you have to have a backup generator. It saved our bacon 10 times since we moved to Connecticut three years ago. Talking about that, let's talk yield discussion. Is now a good time for dividend stocks, especially for retirees? Uh, well, retirees are always uh, looking for income. I don't favor the defensive stocks right now, like utilities, even the pharmaceuticals. Why? Because they don't have bullish power gauge ratings in the main. There's a couple of exceptions, like a Kimberly Clark, but this is the time to, you know, there's an expression, make hay when the sun shines. This is a time to be in growth stocks, uh, quality stocks, where there's huge upside potential 
as the bull market unfolds. I need to go put in some mining stocks. I'm so curious now. Well, uh, commercial metals, yeah. bullish power gauge rating just reported recently. Much better than expected earnings. Stock popped 5% on the earnings report. So commercial metals is an interesting name in the power gauge. Uh, super interesting. Um, now, let's layer on top of all of this. The Fed, uh, uh, you know, Jerome Powell uh, coming out this week, Mark, saying, hey, we're, we're still hawkish here. Expect more uh, rate increase just because we took a pause. There's a long fight ahead, uh, you know, versus inflation. Your, 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 your take on the latest from Powell here. Well, I think Powell has two jobs to do. One of them is to keep the animal spirits from, you know, getting out of hand, <laughs> which is where, look. The animal spirits, yeah, yes. Yeah, because, uh, so he's jawboning the market. He, what he's hoping with these comments yeah. before Congress is, okay, the market will take a pause here, so it puts less pressure on the Fed to you know, dampen things. But the reality is the market is adjusting to higher interest rates. I don't think they'll ever get inflation down to 2% in the next five years. So I think that's an unrealistic goal. 3%, maybe 3.5%. So I, the market is telling you by its reaction to these recent interest rate hikes that it's comfortable with higher rates. So when you hear people say, no, no, we're going to start printing money again next year, you don't, you don't see that happening. Uh, not unless the economy really goes into the tank. And I think that's the conundrum that the fundamental people have, like Mike Wilson at Morgan Stanley mm -hmm. is still looking for 3,000. Come on, this market's not going to 3,000. And I think the economy is a lot stronger than people are giving it credit for. And therefore, I'm not necessarily looking for rates to be cut, but I'm looking for rates to flatten out. How about recession? Where, where do you stand on recession? I mean, Goldman Sachs coming out saying expect a mild recession. I mean. My question is, how do we know what kind of recession it's going to be until we're actually in it? But your thoughts on, on whether we're headed for, for one? This is above my pay grade. There's an, old, <laughs> there's, a, there's an old expression on Wall Street that if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. That, you know, economists are, are paid to have an opinion. I don't think anybody knows. And plus, it's a different economy. You've got cash cows like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, and you have manufacturing that may not be as robust, but this is a different economy. It's not your grandmother's economy. Not your grandmother's economy. And just going back to, to the Fed a second here, I mean, we see what the BOE did, surprising the market with a 50 basis uh, point hike. Do you think Powell's looking at what's happening over in England? I mean, obviously the inflation levels are not the same. Could, could we be that hawkish here as well? I don't think he looks beyond the U.S. economy and, you know, what, he's got to do, which is get inflation down and keep unemployment as low as possible. I, I think we're in almost in a Goldilocks situation where we're just right, not too hot, not too cold. And this, this $5 trillion in money market funds, That's where's right. that going to go? Le okay, but let me ask you this, Mark. Presidential election, will it throw a curveball? Well, we're in the year of the presidential election cycle, the pre-election year when the market finishes with a bang. And that's been part of our roadmap going back a year ago. It's why part of the reason I turned bullish in January, even though the Fed hadn't started cutting rates and we're still raising rates, we should finish the year on a big note. Oh, I, I'm on record as saying 5,000 and the S&P is a possibility, which is 15% up from here. Is there any wild card that concerns you? There's always a wild card, <laughs> yeah. I, um, that's the thing about a wild card. You can't anticipate what it's going to be. Okay. You know? but, yeah. but I like to think about what could go right. Like the yeah, war, I like maybe it. the war, I like in, that. maybe war in Ukraine, uh, you know, ends. Maybe the Fed doesn't raise rates in July, which is now everybody's assumption. And suddenly all this money that's on the sidelines has to find a home. As, as a complete segue, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this talk of de-dollarization. And we saw uh, Janet Yellen for the first time really hint at the fact like, yeah, we, we might see the U.S. dollar lose value against the, the growing number of, uh, of countries looking to diversify outside the U.S. dollar. Does a weakening U.S. dollar concern you? Well, it, it's uh, negative for the international companies like Caterpillar and, uh, you know, maybe Triple M. Uh, and in fact, as Europe raises rates, the dollar is weakening. So um, 
It's not a concern to me. The dollar is going to do what it's going to do. We've had bull markets with strong dollars. We've had bull markets with weak dollars. It's a question of what you're in. So if the dollar is weak, you want to be in U.S.-centric companies, retailers, right. uh, companies that are not multinational.